Welcome to another session of English. Um, my name is Phil Wilcox. Um, we're going to be doing a lesson on Harry Potter. And the lesson is going to be aptly titled, Why J.K. Rowling Didn't Write Harry Potter. Or the subtitle, or Why the J.K. Is on us. Um, please, uh, please join along. Hit me up. Um, maybe just start the start the chat with what's your favorite Harry Potter book? Um, which one's your favorite Harry Potter book? I've got some people in the chat. Ah, uh, good to see you again, Max. Uh, hello. Um, Jeff is cooler. Good afternoon slash evening slash morning. That's right. I am in Australia. It's ten p.m. here and. Um, Hello, whatever time you're at, um, all around the world. I think AMI is in 75 countries right now, which is crazy. Um, so what's your favorite Harry Potter book? Let me know. Um, uh, Japan Maple. Oh, Japan Maple, you had some great comments on our first session of imagery. It's great to see you again, said probably the Chamber of Secrets. Actually, my favorite too. Um, really underrated book. I think it's tight. Really good foreshadowing, the basilisk, the rooster, all that kind of thing. Um, also, maybe let me know in the chat why you think, maybe, why you think J.K. Rowling didn't write Harry Potter. All right. So, why do you think she maybe didn't? Um, I'm getting in a lot of people saying Goblet of Fire, Max. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Nihal. Um, uh, the Pumpkin Master said, hey, Phil. Hey, Pumpkin Master. Um, uh, the pumpkin master said, I haven't read the Harry Potters in ages. I really need to start again. You do. You need to do it yearly. Um, otherwise you're not doing your job. Yes. So, uh, why JK Rowling didn't write Harry Potter? What are your theories? Uh, Japan Maple said she got inspiration from other stories. Ooh, interesting. Maybe she did. Um, uh, we're going to be discussing it and I'm just going to kick things off, uh, with this. <clears throat> why J.K. Rowling... Oh, I'm going to skip ahead here. I'm going to skip ahead to this question. When you think um, of an old man in a movie, who do you think of? In a movie or a book? When you think of an old man, who do you think of? Just let me know. All right. I've got heaps of chat here. Um, uh let me say it's actually a non-fiction recount. Let me see. When you think of an old man, who do you think of? We're going to be investigating and proving why J.K. Rowling did not write Harry Potter. So first up, when you think of an old man in a movie, you might think of one of these people. Movie, book, you might think of one of these people. You might think of a beard, you might think of a staff, you might think Gandalf, Dumbledore, you might think Rafiki, maybe even. Uh, there's Merlin there, Mr. Miyagi, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, this is Alfred from the Batman movies. Um, also in here, we've got um, uh, this guy over here, we got, um, uh, we got Nesta over here, who was like the old wise guy in Greek myths, like the... Uh, the myth of uh, of Troy. Um, you got actually this old guy here. I can't pronounce his name. It starts with a U, but he was the, the first ever old wise dude that was in any story because he was in the first ever story. So all the way back in time, the epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, this guy here was the original old wise dude who was giving advice and helping out our hero. Um, these old wise dudes have been helping out heroes for for eons, for thousands of years in movies, TV shows, in comic books, um, even in Disney animated films like The Lion King. Um, they're what is called, and what um, actually uh, a thinker called Jung called an archetype. And archetypes um, are said to be throughout throughout all of history, throughout, it doesn't matter kind of what... Um, what people group you're from, there are certain archetypes that always seem to appear. And, and Jung got really excited by these archetypes. Um, and he wrote about these archetypes. He had other, other archetypes of a trickster or a, a wise old mother. Um, and you can kind of see these in TV shows and movies. Um, in fact, 
this guy here, Joseph Campbell, Joseph Campbell was obsessed with Jung. So Joseph Campbell was about 1949, so a bit over 50 years ago. Um, he loved Jung. Jung, who is not young, but looks kind of like the word young there, but he's definitely an old dude. Jung had this theory, and this is a pretty crazy theory, but Jung had this theory. Oh man, I'm getting heaps in here. Yes, yeah, some really, 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 really great. Uh, oh, someone said Yoda. I forgot about Yoda. I think you, you said Joda, J-O-D-A, but I think you meant Yoda. Uh, yeah, I forgot about him. I guess him? Maybe Yoda's not a man? I don't know. Let me know in the chat. Um, but we have, over here, we have um, our mate, Joseph Campbell, who was an American thinker, writer, obsessed with Jung. And Jung was obsessed with this theory that he came up with called the collective unconscious. Pretty much which means all of us in the whole world are connected with certain ideas that are very, very, very similar. His idea was that because we all dream similar dreams of flying, um, we all have similar dreams of losing our teeth. We all have dreams of being naked sometimes. Um, because we all had these similar dreams, we all kind of have these similar symbols and processing that binds us in a collective unconscious. And because of that, all of these things and these symbols and these dreams and these ways of making sense of the world mean that we have kind of similar characters for stories. Now, maybe you can guess where I'm going with this, that J.K. Rowling actually... <clears throat> did not write Harry Potter, is that Joseph Campbell picked up on this idea and thought, hang on, if there are similar characters and archetypes like the old wise man, well, maybe, maybe there's similar stories. And he had this idea uh, and he wrote about it in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Um, his idea was that the hero with a, a, a thousand faces. Oh, before I go... Uh, J Japan Maple says, I have dreams of falling. Lol. Wow. You're not a very good flyer, ja Japan Maple. Get better at flying in your dreams. What else? What else? What, what crazy dreams have you guys had? Um, I had a dream the other day. This is, it's a pretty weird dream. Um, I had a dream that I was, was a shark and I was attacking someone. Someone interpret that dream for me, please. What was your dream? Maybe we can interpret it. Um, Joseph I have some, some here's uh, Leonardo Pez says Joseph Campbell he's from Star Wars oh my goodness you're jumping ahead he was kind of influential there yes because he wrote this book the hero with a thousand faces which was a theory that all these heroes from different times like King Arthur or uh, different um, uh, Hold on a second. I'm just going to fix this in screen mirroring. All right. Okay. Hit me up with your dreams. Okay. I had a dream when I was younger that I was chasing a squirrel and then a T-Rex started chasing me. Then the dino was about to eat me, but then I woke up. Whoa. Crazy dream. t Um. Uh. Okay. Uh, I don't know what that dream means. Um, maybe that you should stop eating old chocolate before bed. I don't know. What do you think that dream means? Someone says, I had a dream I fell off a train. Um, someone said, I had a dream when I was younger. Oh, yeah. Wow, there was so much, so much uh, chat on here. Guys, I'm going to get stuck into it because I'm going to get distracted with all your great dreams. So, S Joseph Campbell's theory was that all of these people, whether you were King Arthur, the story of King Arthur, or the story of uh, maybe the story of Batman. Uh, I'm trying to draw a cape there. Batman. Um, no matter all these stories were the same story over and over again. And he had this theory that the story be called, could be called the hero's journey. And the hero's journey kind of acted like a wheel um, and it started off here at status quo and then it ended back at status quo 
Now, I'm going to do a little challenge. I'm going to see if what we can do is if we can map on the story of Harry Potter, specifically the Philosopher's Stone, or if you're in America, the Sorcerer's Stone, and specifically the movie, which is actually quite similar to the books and is the most uh, similar to any of the books of any of the movies. However, there are a few key differences. Um, and we're going to see if it matches onto this uh, framework that he came up with in 19... 59, wait, 1949, and we're going to see if it matches. So to start off with status quo, the movie of Harry Potter begins, that's right, it begins with him at the, oh, sorry, I'm just getting it up here. It begins with him at the Dursleys! <laughs> That's right. And that is the status quo. He's miserable at the Dursleys. He hates it. That's right. Um, and that is all interrupted in a call for an adventure, which happens literally by an owl with a letter. The letter that we all hoped that we would get, um, inviting us to Hogwarts. His call to adventure. Maybe his life isn't just the mundane with the Dursleys. Maybe there's a call to adventure of something greater. Um, okay. Then some supernatural aid happens. Now, because this is Harry Potter, there's lots of supernatural aid, but there's a specific scene. Can anyone think of the specific scene of supernatural aid, which maybe kickstarts this whole progress, uh, this whole process of the hero's journey for Harry Potter in the first Harry Potter? Um, have a little think. Uh, uh, Kieran Wyatt said the pigtail. Exactly the pigtail. The scene where Hagrid comes in and Hagrid comes in... Uh, literally breaking down the door and with his little wand that's actually an umbrella he makes Dudley Dursley have a little pigtail the magical intervention the supernatural aid that comes in to start the story whisking Harry Potter away and he whisks Harry Potter away but then he has to sort of cross from the muggle world to the magical world this is often uh often a hero's journey he starts off here in the ordinary world and then it ends up in the special world does anyone know where that point in the story is by the way major spoilers guys this has been out a long time i don't think this is a spoiler but thanks thanks max yeah um uh someone said uh the brick wall yes the brick wall has anyone been to that brick wall specifically it's in london i've been there uh it's oh not this one it is Platform nine and three quarters. Um, shout out if you've been there before. They have actually a place you can take photos. But he crosses from the Muggle world, literally going into a crossing threshold um, into the world, the magical world of Harry Potter. And then this next section, Road of Trials, is actually quite a long section. Um, many heroes have to go through many trials that, uh, where they learn things, they make friends, and they make enemies. Um, so in Harry Potter, obviously he makes enemies, Draco Mal Malfoy, obviously also there is, uh, just boring things he has to overcome, like studies, obviously there's more exciting things he has to overcome, like playing Quidditch, and then maybe there's even more exciting things like trying to defeat a troll, uh, do you remember that scene where Harry and Ron try and defeat the troll because they're trying to save Hermione and then they all become friends and they all become a trio. Um, so anyway, the road of trials kind of um, starts with that. Um, uh, all these things that the hero learns and th the hero gains by becoming kind of friends uh, and uh, learning along the way. So there's the, there's the road of trials. Then what happens is the approach. So you can kind of see that one there. Does anyone know what the approach might be? Uh, it's a weird one. I don't know if you've ever played uh, a video game and all of a sudden all the bad guys that you find on the video game um, suddenly become way more HP. They become um, harder to take down. The music gets more intense and you just know that very soon afterwards you're about to fight the big boss. That's the approach. And the approach happens in Harry Potter kind of um, very like towards the end of the book. Um... That's it. Japan Maple says setting up the main action. Um, 
Uh, Kieran White said, is this maybe where Voldemort comes into play? Kind of, almost, Voldemort comes a little bit after that, but just before Voldemort comes into play, um, there's all these ch uh, sort of challenges that happen. Um, the first one is they have to get past... Does anyone know who, who this character is? Does anyone remember? Uh, have to get past my favourite dog. That's it, Japan Maple. It is Fluffy. Get past Fluffy. And Fluffy is actually a three-headed dog, actually based upon the myth of Cerebrus, the hellhound in ancient Greece that guards the gates of the dead. So literally, when they go down underground past Cerebrus, they're almost descending into like a metaphorical death. Um, and then there's challenges that, uh, that kind of map onto all the trials that Harry Potter has learnt, like... For instance, the friendships he's made uh, with Ron helping him out with the chess game and with Hermione helping out with the Devil's Snare and then also the things that Harry Potter has learnt, like he's really good at Quidditch and so he has to catch the keys and that sort of helped him along the way. So all of these approaches kind of are, are foreshadowed by the road of trials until we get to the ordeal and bum 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 that is Voldemort Voldemort is there and uh he's not happy he's not a happy boy he's got two faces um it's Professor Quirrell and this is the big ordeal this is the big climax the big boss moment in Harry Potter and the thing that he has to overcome um now I don't know if you remember in the books but uh, Lord Voldemort wants the, Vold uh, wants the Philosopher's Stone so he can take on a physical body. Um, Harry Potter would like the Philosopher's Stone because maybe it would bring back his parents. Um, and when he can't get the Philosopher's Stone, uh, when he can't get the Voldemort can't get the Philosopher's Stone, he works out he needs to use the boy to get the Philosopher's Stone. And because Harry Potter is <clears throat> pure of heart, and actually doesn't want to use the stone to bring back his parents. Um, he just wants the stone to make sure that Voldemort doesn't get it. He's rewarded, and he's rewarded with the Philosopher's Stone. And he gets it in his pocket, and that's his reward. But unfortunately, this makes uh, Quirrell Voldemort mad and uh, try to go after Harry Potter, get the stone, Harry Potter fends them off, touches Quirrell on the face, which actually melts him, and he starts melting him, and, and then uh, all the world um, and the chamber that they're in starts to fall apart, and then the next section is the magic flight, or the kind of leaving of that ordeal, and in a sort of magical way, in a way that um, you need some intervention from a higher force, and who is the highest force in this world? It's Dumbledore. Um, this is scene isn't actually in the movie, uh, but we're just going to... I'm just gonna have a little, little, little Dumbledore, little, 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 little Albus Dumbledore there for the magic flight. Picks Harry up and takes him, but Harry is unconscious and he's dying. Um, so he returns. He returns back to the sick bay, the hospital wing, um, and he's returned safely and he is revived. And this reviving is almost like a resurrection. He's descended into death, metaphorical death past the hellhound, and he comes back up into life and he's revived by this magical figure by, by Dumbledore and he's kind of resurrected and he's back with all the people. He's back in the Great Hall. There's a big celebration and the resolution is actually uh, that he is rewarded for his bravery um, uh, do you remember that bit where uh, uh, Hermione, Ron get awards, Harry gets an award, which means that they're tied with Slytherin with the house points, and then all of a sudden um, Neville Longbottom gets 10 points for Gryffindor, which means that Gryffindor win the house cup. This is the resolution. And then all of a sudden it goes back to the status quo, and the status quo is he's returning back to the Dursleys, but he's returning having learnt that he now has a true family that friends will get him where he needs to go and that actually uh, he doesn't need to be a victim anymore. So he comes in and he makes himself a chalky milk and he says, chocolate milk, um, and he says, um, 
uh, almost in a sort of like a, there's a sort of a threat that, hey, don't mess with me, Dursleys. Don't put me under the stairs because I might magic you. Um, so he returns to normal, but he's not normal anymore. He's learned, he's changed, he's a hero. Um, and that is the hero's journey. Now, I was wondering, Harry Potter and the Chalky Milk was the unreleased prequel. That's right, Pumpkin Master. master. Um, uh, okay, uh, so I was wondering if maybe anyone here has a, I don't know, a suggestion for something that we could use to map onto the hero's journey. Um, does anyone here have an epic story from a movie that they love or a book that I might be able to do for the hero's journey? Anyone here? Uh, any suggestions on the feed? Let me know. Okay, Kieran Wyatt said, Lord of the Rings. Okay, I'm gonna really quickly do Lord of the Rings and I'm gonna map it onto the hero's journey. Here we go. I'm gonna do this so fast because we got one other activity to get to. Okay, status quo. Frodo is, uh, this is for uh, Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and the last one, The Return of the King, all together. So status quo, they are in the Shire. Great, they're in the Shire. Thank you for that. And then all of a sudden there's a call to adventure. Oh no, uh, he gets given a ring. He gets given a ring and told to look after it. Um, there is uh, uh, a call to adventure. Oh, and the call to adventure is uh, you need to look after the ring and now you need to meet me. Uh, Gandalf says, you need to meet me in Bree. Um, so the supernatural aid is um, they go on this journey, they go on a journey, they go on the journey, and then they finally get to Rivendell where they get a whole bunch of different magical items, um, supernatural aid. Then they cross the threshold. They cross the threshold. Um, they go out from Rivendell into the wild and the fellowship has begun. Um, there's, a whole ro there's a whole lot of trials there. They have to fight orcs. Um, uh, they have to uh, deal with kind of the, the, the corruption within the fellowship. Um, there's the approach after all of this mess and there's so many trials in, in all of Lord of the Rings. Uh, the approach is going into Mordor and the approach up to Mount Doom to destroy the ring. The ordeal is the tussle at the top and finally destroying the ring while the battle for Middle Earth is going down below. And then the reward is that Frodo is released from that burden. The ring is destroyed. Sauron is destroyed. The magical flight where Frodo literally escapes from Mordor is actually literally a magical flight. It's eagles taking him all the way back to safety and he uh, is returned back to um, to Gondor where he's almost <gasps> revived after being in pain and being like kind of like downtrodden and being um, unconscious for days. He's like almost resurrected and a scene where he's kind of like brought back and he sees all the fellowship. And the resolution is that Middle-earth has been saved um, that Frodo is rewarded, but then status quo, he returns all the way back to the Shire. Now he doesn't have, to, he's completely changed as a hero, so he can't stay there. He moves on to somewhere else, but Sam stays there and sort of the status quo kind of continues, but people have learned. So actually this plot has been around for ages. It exists in so many stories. Um, and it's kind of exciting. It's kind of really exciting because uh, what has happened here with J.K. Rowling is she's taken um, an ancient kind of story that exists in ancient Greek stories, um, stories from from, from uh, the ancient world in Samaria, um, kind of like King Arthur. There's the Hunger Games. There's Lord of the Rings. There's Narnia. There's all of these stories that are sort of kind of one story, and they have this one structure. And Jung thinks that, and Joseph Campbell thinks that maybe that's kind of like a human sort of structure. Like it it goes to something core in our humanity. Um, and for this reason, uh, she might have written uh, Harry Potter, but the very fabric and guts of it has been around for a long time. I was thinking we could write our very own story here on AIM Live. Now this is pretty experimental, but we've got, tw we got 12 little, um, little sections and little beats. I want to ask you on the chat line if we can create our own epic story, starting with the status quo. Okay, give me a place and give me a character. And that is going to be our hero and that's where they start. Uh, 
The Pumpkin Master said, I wonder if this is why we're so un- entertained by these stories, if they're all repeated. Yeah, maybe. We kind of know where they're going and they're kind of deeply satisfying. Maybe that's their, why they're entertaining. Um, okay, the place is Antarctica. This is the status quo. We're in Antarctica and the hero is a penguin. Okay. Antarctica, Antarctica, hero is a penguin. I'm sorry for my messy writing. I gotta be quick. Okay, let's go on. Okay, the call to adventure for this penguin. What's the call to adventure for this penguin? What is the penguin, how is the penguin call to adventure? You might need more words. Okay, Leonardo Pez said, this penguin is called, uh, oh wait, uh, to be a ninja. And then Big Nish and Chip said, uh, okay, first penguin to fly. The first penguin to fly and battle people, uh, battle someone evil as a ninja flying penguin. Okay, that's what we're gonna, we're gonna go with. Ninja flying penguin. Okay, uh, that's the call to adventure. Okay, crossing the threshold. The penguin has to go from a safe place of Antarctica somewhere else. What's the threshold? Where is it going? Um, uh, someone said the North Pole is melting. That's kind of cool. Penguins are on the South Pole. Um, penguin finds a magical fish that calls him into the dark, deep ocean. Yes, I love that. Okay, magical fish, dark, deep ocean. I like that. Okay, uh, road of trials. I need three things that, uh, so we had this uh, penguin in Antarctica who, uh, needs to be called to be a flying ninja fighting penguin to save uh, his or her homeland um, from uh, what are some road of trials? What are some things that they need to overcome in order to do that? Okay, someone said, Kieran White said, sea lion. Okay, sea lion. I like that. Um, um, It's DS27 said, global global warming monster. I like that. Uh, Maybe... Maybe the sea lion could be a global warming monster. Okay, let's let's go with that. Um, and Big Nishin Chip said oil companies. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the approach. Now remember, uh, what's going to happen is there's going to be one big bad guy, and this is the approach up to the bad guy. Who's the bad guy? And but but think of that. But how does how does our hero penguin get there? Um, okay. So Adam on Jupiter said the sea lion is the CEO of an oil company. Great. Let's put that down for the ordeal. Uh, sea lion is CEO of oil company. Okay. So the approach to that, um, (laughs) Kieran Wise and Nemo is bad guy. Like it. Um, uh, there's gotta be an approach. Uh, uh, let me see. I think the approach would need to be with the skills that the penguin has learnt of flying. Um, I think the sea lion must have an air base that he needs to get to and he needs to fly. Um, so that's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with air base. I'm just going to do cloud air base and then fly. Okay. These are just notes for me. Okay. Now the ordeal is going to be that going to fight the sea lion of the this CEO oil company who's in a suit. Um, uh, let's have a look. How are they going to do that? Um, see, okay, he's in space. The airbase is in in space. Um, he's going to fight the sea lion, um, and then he's going to win. And what is his reward for winning? What's his reward? Uh, does he get something for himself? Does he get something for the group? Or does he get both? Or does he only get one? What is his reward? <laughs> Fish and well peace. I like that. Okay. His reward is fish and well peace. Um, then he... Oh my goodness. This matches perfectly. His magical flight. His magical flight is a victory flight, right? Surely it's a victory flight. His magical flight is a victory flight all the way back to his home in Antarctica. (laughs) Okay. Uh, So he returns back to the colony, the penguin colony. 
Um, and then, all right, I'm going to try and tell the story because we're out of time. Are you ready for this? Okay. Guys, this is a story that was written by you guys for you guys. I'm going to try and read it out in a storytelling way. <clears throat> Once upon a time, in the ever-growing climate, and sorry, once upon a time in the ever-warming Antarctic, there was a sprightly little penguin named Jeff is Cooler. Jeff might have been cooler, but the poles weren't getting any cooler. In fact, they were, <clears throat> they were being heated and warmed by a cloud space station dwelling sea lying CEO of an oil company that was piping down hot boiling oil for all of his greedy sea lion and leopard seal friends to consume these penguins. This penguin colony was being decimated. A hero needed to rise. One day, <clears throat> a magical talking sea bass spoke to the penguin. And the penguin was about to eat the sea bass, but the sea bass said, I know that normally you eat me, but maybe you could protect me. Now, Jeff is cooler. The ninja penguin thought, what do you mean? And the sea bass said, you need to learn the ways of ninja and flying. And the penguin said, Jeff is cool, said, flying? I can't fly. I'm a penguin. I don't fly at all. And then Seabass said, follow me. And then whew, they dived into the depths of the deepest part of the ocean, the Marianas Trench, where Seabass taught the penguin fight anglerfish with being a ninja. Had to overcome trials, like trials of pufferfish blowing up. Had to overcome all these obstacles until finally, Seabass said, you're ready for your last trial. Finally, you need to learn to fly. And Jeff is cooler said, fly? I, 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 I can't fly. But actually, you can fly. Flap your wings like you're swimming like this. And Jeff is cooler than flapped his wings. Jeff is cooler than soared off down deep into the Marianas Trench and then up came again and realized that flying for a penguin was underwater and that if Jeff is cooler that could fly underwater, then maybe he could fly in the sky. And so, <clears throat> and so bursting forth, bursting forth, up from the waves and into the air, Jeff is cooler started flapping his wings like no penguin ever had, but up in the air and up and up he started to take flight. And in glinting up was the space jet, space station owned by the evil sea lion who had the name Big Nish and Chips. Big Nish and Chips was not a not a good sea lion. It was a big that sea lion with a stretched out suit. And as uh, as Jeff is cooler approached Big Nish and Chips, kind of soaring through the air, doubting himself, he was buffeted by a wind <sighs> that veered him off course. And he fell and fell until he was about to splash in the ocean. And at that moment thought, no, I've been taught by sea bass. I can do this flapped in the air, soared up into the air until he crashed into the space station of Big Nish and Chips, the sea lion, the evil oil magnate who was heating the planet and pumping oil to all his leopard seal friends so they could eat all the penguins. And then with his ninja skills that he learned fighting the puffer fish, went and fought the evil, the evil oil magnate until he fell down into the water victorious and afresh, all of a sudden, he flew down, Jeff is cooler, and soared down over the air past the penguin colony, looking down at all the people, all the penguins who previously thought Jeff is cooler was crazy for leaving the colony. He could never fly. He could never be a ninja. Flew down, 
and joined his friends anew with new knowledge that actually maybe their planet might be better off now that that pesky oil magnet was gone. And Jeff is cooler, was a hero. So the hero's journey. There we have it. Now, this is my challenge to you. I just wrote a story. No, you just wrote a story that I told um, conforming to the hero's journey here. What I'm going to do now is in the chat, I'm going to link a very handy YouTube video. And this YouTube video, uh, it, uh, it outlines some ways in which you can write the hero's journey um, and how you can put it together to write your own stories. Then what I want you to do, if you have time, and maybe I... Uh, I'm overstepping it here, is write your own hero's journey. Make it as crazy or as weird or as long. Um, make it funny or don't. Make it serious. However you want to make it. And then I want you to send it to me at my Instagram. I want you to send it to me. And then if I get a couple of really good ones, I'm going to choose the best one. And I'm going to tell it on my next live, which is on Thursday. Um, so send it to me. Um, I'd love to read it. It can be super short. It can just be like half a page if you want. And um, that's all from me. Remember uh, that JK Rowling might not have stolen Harry Potter, but the guts of that story have existed for mil no for thousands of years. Um, I'm Phil Wilcox. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your input. Thank you for your very creative ideas. Um, get writing. I'm going to link it in the chat and say hello to a couple of people as well. But um, thank you so much for, for uh, uh, tuning in. All right. See you guys.